Okay, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome. Um, I think we're gonna get straight into it and jump right in. We have 40 minutes and an incredible group of people here to share what I hope will be a masterclass in building a mission-driven brand. Um, let's just start and jump right in with everyone introducing themselves, a little bit about what you do, and if you could just start with your advice on crafting and building a mission and the mission-driven brand at your respective organization. So how about we start with you, Kate? So just a softball to start off. Just an easy one. Great. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I'm Kate Beal. I'm the chief marketing officer for GoGuardian. Uh, we are a company that serves 25 million students across the United States. And we actually have a portfolio of five brands and seven different products. So at our organization, mission is extremely important. It's actually the one thing that I think truly binds all of our products and their different expressions, kind of how we serve students. And so um, for me, I think, uh, Consistency and authenticity uh, is probably at the core of a mission-driven brand. Um, in my experience, and I've been fortunate to, to work with a lot of companies who were envisioning their mission for the very first time, uh, it can be really hard to put meaning into those words. At some point, your words can just be like, well, everybody's mission is the mission. And so I really believe that the lived uh, experience within a company and the values that you have adopted to underpin that mission is probably as critical as uh, any product decision that you're going to make. Who you are in the world and how you express yourself becomes really critical. So, uh Hi, I'm Allison Bryant. I'm the Chief Research Data and Impact Officer at Sesame Workshop. So ditto to what Kate said. Um, uh, so I'm going to assume that a lot of you are familiar with Sesame Street. Uh, that's what we're most known for, but I think most people don't know that uh, we're a 54-year-old organization that has been global since year two, or international since year two. Uh, we're currently in 150 countries and serve millions of kids every year. Um, and in, in fact, in the last five years, have spent a lot of our time focused on children in crisis and conflict settings. So that's the kind of things that most people don't have any idea. I think Sesame Workshop really interesting as well because we have always been a mission-driven brand. We are a nonprofit, although most people don't know that. We can talk about that at some point in time because we have such a, um, a strong brand out in the world. Um, and I think for us, um, I'd probably add on to what Kate said and I'd say accountability and trust. I think those two things for us are really critical when we're thinking about building a mission-driven brand. Um, we are a double bottom line organization. We're a nonprofit, but we also play in the commercial space. And again, we've been like that since day one. I really think about us as one of the first global social enterprises that went out in the world and really thought of ourselves both from a financial perspective, but also from an impact perspective. Great. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ravi. I'm founder and CEO of brightgems.com. Uh, BrightGems is a company which provides new age skills to kids across the globe. We are present in right now 25 countries with teachers and tutors across uh, more than 15 countries. Uh, young startup, like two and a half year old, but uh, growing fast. Uh, as far as the mission of the company is concerned, it's very simple and profound. And that is about, you know, can we equip all the children across the globe with new age skills, which ideally should have been part of the curriculum, but unfortunately they are not. Uh, things like, you know, financial literacy, things like technology education, things like robotics, things like effective communication, right? As far as the question uh, about crafting the mission is concerned, I think there are three key ingredients to it. One is, first of all, it has to come from a personal conviction. Like for example, I myself, I'm a homeschool child, never went to a school because you can say me that I was a rebellion to, to the conventional education. When I grew up, I was, I was working in the technology sector in various uh, startup. And I found a lot of feedback from society that, you know, people who were in the technology domain, they used to say that, you know, if I would have had the awareness of financial uh, uh, literacy, then we would have landed in a superlative outcome in our life. Similarly, people who were from different domain, they were saying that, you know, if, if we would have had the knowledge of technology, we would have done better, right? So there was a constant feedback from the society that, you know, these new age skills are very, very important and they are becoming a barrier to growth to people, right? And uh, when you have personal conviction and a strong feedback from society, and the third ingredient is that you, know, you need to have a very strong execution plan around it, I think these three things are very, very important as far as crafting a mission-driven brand is concerned. Yeah. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Mary Beach. I'm the Chief Marketing and Transformation Officer at Scholastic, uh, the children's book publisher. Uh, and Scholastic, I, I think I represent the oldest company on the panel. Um, we were founded in 1920. And about 10 years later, uh, the leadership crafted a credo. And at the time, we were a magazine publisher, publi uh, magazines for high school students. And the credo really served as an editorial platform. Um, but it underpinned the mission and the purpose of the company, our reason for being. And it has been largely unchanged for 100 years. And as the company grew, and I think this is a testament to the strength of the mission, it informed the business model of the additional businesses we went into. Our proprietary school distribution businesses, probably how you know Scholastic, our fairs and our clubs, um, their business model is about giving back. Last year, our fairs gave $200 million back to schools in profit sharing because that's how the business model works. And our clubs are set up to provide free books and build classroom libraries, so the same thing. So I think as you're building mission, um, to ensure that your mission generates value, for us, our mission generates value for our shareholders. We are a public company. Um, and it generates value for society. So doing good, as some might say, uh, is not secondary to us to doing business. It is how we make business happen is by doing good. And by doing good, we create more business for Scholastic. So I think that if you can make it foundational to your business model and make uh, your mission foundational to how you operate and how you serve both society and you know, your company and your employees and your shareholders, if that's your case, um, it, it helps make all the decisions easier uh, and helps make your mission more than something like all of these folks have said. It, it has to be more than a statement on the wall. And I think by making making it foundational to your business model, that can happen. Thank you so much there. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Ankit. I'm uh, the CEO and uh, co-founder of uh, a young startup, uh, Quizzes. And at Quizzes, our mission is to motivate each and every student. We do it by empowering uh, the teachers. We today are supporting uh, teachers uh, in 150 plus countries where they found, you know, they related to the mission which we were going after, where this idea that, you know, I strongly believe that in this day and age, it's the desire to learn which is the limiting factor. And uh, at Quizzes, we try to kind of live by that mission, build our product with that. And, you know, that is something uh, I'd say as a company, every day what you do kind of, uh, shows up. So especially when you're growing up as a company, as a startup, uh, that, you know, living the mission becomes important. And the first step there is just defining what you are and doing what, you know, on everyday decisions which you make. I think that is how we think about our mission. Brilliant. So I've heard a lot of incredible insights already. So building trust, uh, being authentic, building it and baking it into the business model. Something that I would love to dig into actually, and maybe we can start with Kate, starting back with you and, and Go Guardian. but how does your mission bleed into your product or your service? How does your mission and, and sort of your, your ethos drive the, the work that you're doing and, and the customer experience that you're trying to target? So our Vision is a world where all learners are ready and inspired to solve the greatest challenges. And we really kind of look at that as um, you know, our true north. And we are a company who has grown inorganically. We've had a lot of acquisitions. And it's been an interesting thing to, uh, if you've ever been part of a company where you're acquiring other companies, they come to you and they had a mission. Uh, they had a particular point of view. They had something that they were building towards. and. I think one of the things in our mission is that we've recognized that we can maintain that true north, but that how we achieve that mission is going to evolve. The actual practical elements of what does it mean to empower and inspire students? What do we need to build? How do we stay responsive to the world as it's changing and to education as it's changing? We're all here at this conference where, oh my goodness, like the number of things I've heard in the last few days that are 
really challenging to the status quo of education and to how educational technologies can support or hinder progress. Um, there's been tons of insight shared. And so I think the way it expresses it, um, our mission expresses itself in product is that it's allowed us to really continue to kind of come back to that true north. So when we're thinking about growing the company by adding a new service, when we're thinking about you know, how do we uh, measure the efficacy of our products? Uh, it really links back to that. And, um, you know, I think we were very deliberate in trying to create a mission that would stand the test of time and that would allow us as a company that was kind of in a, an early stage of growth. We're not nearly at 50 years or 100 years. I can't even imagine. Um, so tending to that is really about, it's the rallying cry. It's how do we unite our sales our marketing, our product leaders, you know, our customer service people to understand this is the big picture. This is why we do what we do. It's not the specific products we build, it's the opportunity to influence students' lives so that we build a better world together. And I'd say that's what's gonna make you be 50 or 100 years, right? Hopefully, that's, the, that's kind of the point. So I wish, if I can add on to that, I think yeah, you know, from, a, from a Sesame perspective, there's really um, sort of two things that come to mind. The first is at a higher order, our impact agenda, which really leads everything, all of our strategic decision making. So we have four core impact areas. These are the areas that we're saying that we are dedicated to as an organization to moving the needle for children and families, right? So for us, it's foundational knowledge and skills, emotional well-being, creativity and playful problem solving, and identity and belonging. Everything we do should be laddering up to those, right? So that's one piece, is just having a very clear strategy and impact agenda. The second piece is the way that we actually build our products and programs and content. And so again, from day one, we've always had this really beautiful tension and this little triangle that you'll see all over the place in our, con in our um, you know, internal documents, which is we have three key components of anything that we build. The first is research. And that is throughout the product life cycle, right? Starting with the needs assessment and the market work and um, then going all the way through the evaluation, right? So research through the whole process. Um, education is the other critical piece. It means in-house experts, but also going externally and making sure that we know what is best in class, what is best practice, having those advisories at all times. And then the third part is that creative and production. And um, again, really thinking about the fact that we're not an educational product only, we are something that has to compete in the marketplace, right? We are competing against Paw Patrol, against, for those of you who have kids, against uh, Bluey, although I love Bluey, um, against Coco Melon. I'm rolling my eyes if you can't see me. So, I mean, th that's the reality, right? So what we develop has to be super engaging. And that is an actual tension that we live on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So we have creatives who are wanting to create the thing that's the most exciting and compelling. That's being, you know, it's almost like uh, checks and balances, you know, in the government. And then you have research saying, well, okay, that's great, but we got to do formative tests and make sure it works and if it doesn't work we got to go back and we got to fix it so I would say both again this higher order agenda and then the actual ways we do our work make sure that we are um, really accountable again to uh, our consumers in the end yeah I absolutely agree in fact I would say that when you have a simple and clear uh, purpose right with a, with a very uh, you know clearly defined mission it it does not only you know, impact the way you are building your product, right? That's just one aspect. The kind of people you hire, the kind of discussions you do, the kind of uh, surveys you do, the kind of uh, product you build, the kind of advice you get, right? I, I'll say a couple of examples. Uh, so, as I said earlier that, you know, we are a young startup, like two and a half year old, right? You know, expanded to 30 countries. By the end of the day, you know, growth and all those things are important. You know, recently we formed a global curriculum advisory board with people from various walks of life, right? You know, people who are representing the biggest school chains, people who are representing the biggest platform for kids across the globe, people who are very high quality academicians, right? People who are authors, right? And this kind of heterogeneous sort of setup was maybe for a young startup like ours, maybe required, maybe not required, people had conflicting views, right? But then one bold, you know, important thing which you have to keep on checking is that, you know, does this align with my mission, right? If it aligns, period, right? There is, no, there is no if and but around it, right? Similarly, you know, we recently launched a Brightchamps Foundation platform. We said that, you know, whatever we are doing, that's good. It's serving to a certain segment of society, but then can we serve to those segments also which is not so privileged, right? 
And people said that, you know, does this, is this a good financial decision, right? Maybe business-wise, you know, you can debate about it, but at the end of the day, if you have a very clearly articulated mission statement for yourself, right, everybody aligns to it, right? And that is what I'm trying to convey is that, uh, you know, people can say that, you know, growth is important and business numbers are, uh, you know, very, very essential right now. It will be essential always. But then if you double down and ask yourself fundamentally that, you know, is it aligning, aligning with the mission? And if the answer is yes, you know, you should just go about it, right? So be it product building or anything, I think, uh, you know, uh, it becomes the culture, you know, the previous session was around it, and I, I think that, you know, you have a clearly articulated mission, everything revolves around it. I actually would love to sort of double down on a comment that you made about if there's a clearly articulated mission, everybody is aligned. And I want to tap into, I think, a statement, Ravi, that you made in a 2018 podcast saying, but don't worry, it's, it's not going to be bad. <laughs> but you said um, a superstar team is better than a team of superstars. And I think, you know, a huge part of executing um, this mission and building products that are relevant is being able to, to work within a team, which you all do. And so I'm curious about, like, how have you built alignment and worked with teams on ensuring that, like, that mission that everybody believes in and joins the company to do um, actually comes out in the work that you do? Have you experienced any tension with this? Um, yeah. So anybody can kind of take that, but... Sure. You know. I'll, I'll take my, uh, I'll take it, uh, you know, because I have some decent personal experiences, right? See, I, I feel that uh, human beings are fundamentally motivated for success, right? Nobody goes to Olympics to not win a gold medal, right? Uh, so what I'm trying to convey is that, you know, people who join you, right, they also want to be successful. All the employees, all the people who are, you know, in different ways a stakeholder in the company, right? If you clearly articulate what you are planning to do, and if the, if the purpose is larger than life, everything boils down, right? And people who don't align with the purpose will ultimately get eliminated out, right? But then you have to, at the same time, you have to ensure that you, know, you have a heterogeneous set of people with diverse thinking, and, and you need to appreciate it, right? People will come with different things, right? So tactically, they can be different, but strategically, at a top level, they have to be aligned with the, the common purpose, right? There will be tension. I, I can tell you there will be tension because there is so much diversity in this world, right? By the end of the day, if the common connect is that particular mission, everything gets sorted out because people also want to, you know, achieve, right? So, uh, you know, it all is about, you know, how, how clear. If you, are, if you are fluctuating in terms of your mission statement, you know, it may create chaos in the company. But if you are consistent and very, very clear in terms of articulating it to different people, it makes absolute sense. I wanted to add a, such an interesting question. Um, I've worked, I never worked at a company that didn't have a clearly articulated mission. Um, everyone has had one. But at Scholastic, it's, it's so foundational in core um, that it, it comes to another level. Um, and again, I, I do think it, it, Scholastic has a, a level of deep purpose. Um, uh, Ranjay Gulati wrote a book called Deep Purpose last year. He was a former chairman of the Advanced Management Program at Harvard Business School. And I, I read that book and I thought that is Scholastic because it's foundational. But that does create tensions. Our mission is to enrich the lives of children with the joy and power of reading. At first blush, like everybody is on board with that. That makes complete sense. But within that, you have the joy of reading, which is about finding a book that you love. And we have business units devoted to creating those books and distributing those books. And then you have the power of reading, which is about the ability to read and that ability to unlock the socioeconomic advantage, the uh, life advantage, civic participation, all the things that come with the ability to read. And we have a division that is solely devoted to helping children learn to read. And so within that, you have the joy of reading and the power of reading. So a simple statement as, you know, we're here to get more books in the hands of kids, that's not going far enough. Getting books in the hands of kids is not enough if they can't read those books. And we feel super passionately about that at Scholastic. Um, but it can become a source of just energy and passion when everybody is working and feels, and is literally there for the mission. That can create energy and passion around topics that other people will be like, you really had four meetings about that? That like that to everybody? And you're like, yes, because we feel super passionately about it. And we need to make sure that that balance of the joy and the power of reading is never leading too far to one side or that we don't have the fact that 
to not enough children know how to read to in, you know, enjoy the books that we're putting out is a real problem. We have to address that. So I think it, it, um, it really provides a wonderful platform if you have that mission to have really great debates and conversations as a company and to unlock new businesses and new opportunities. And just wanted to add on top of what Ravi was saying, I think especially at an early stage, if you have a very, uh, very clear mission and if you articulate it right, the kind of people you attract is, are going to then define you know, some of those product choices. We were talking about like how your mission defines your product. So there, like, if I think from a quizzes perspective, I feel, especially at an early stage, the culture which you build, that defines you know, the operating principles to help you achieve that mission. And there, like, again, having a clear articulation attracts the right kind of uh, folks in the system and then you know when we are building these products when we are making these everyday choices there's always a trade-off there's always a choice on like hey should we do it in way x way y there might be some short-term wins by taking one path but if your mission is clear i think your team feels empowered to take right choices make right choices if i give an example like with quizzes i think we went out after student motivation, but then, you know, we all know kids, they love to just stay engaged, play games, but then at the same time, we wanted to make sure as a company, we are creating this right environment where engagement and rigor is together, uh, where as a teacher, as a student, while I'm motivated to continue, uh, you know, spending time, um, on practicing, but at the same time, you know, the time which is being spent actually achieves the rigor which is required in the classroom. And there as a company, I think we had to make many choices to make sure the platform which we were building was just not about engagement. So again, just clearly defining what your mission is, then aligns the team to then make those smart choices. I think actually to, to pivot slightly, but on a related note, I want to dig into a theme that's come up, which is really accountability. How do you hold yourselves and hold your organizations accountable to the mission that you've set out? What are the structures that you put in place? Like I said, the goal today is a bit of a masterclass, so really kind of looking for what are the, the practices that you've put in place to keep yourselves and your organizations accountable to that mission? And obviously, I'm going to call you out, Alison, on this, <laughs> given your role, but um, <laughs> folks will jump in as... as yeah, people. absolutely. Uh, she knows that I'm a little bit passionate about accountability. Um, so uh, again, uh, let me talk about it maybe in two ways for us. So one I would say is, how are we measuring ourselves in general as an organization? So for us, um, our dashboard has four key components. Double bottom line company, you've got finance, you've got impact. I'll talk a little bit about how we measure impact in a second. Um, so those obviously are going to be two critical pieces for a double bottom line. We also, for us, measure brand because that is part of our currency, right? That is our trust with our consumers and with our constituents. So brand is super important. And then we have employee engagement. Right? So you could actually probably call that triple bottom line in many cases. right? So all four of those things are things that we are holding ourselves accountable to and making sure that we are measuring ourselves for that. So I think that at a, at a sort of a higher order is really critical. Then let me talk a little bit about impact. So our impact model has three critical pieces. And again, this is our impact model. I would say it depends on your organization what's going to be most important for you. So for us, we look at reach, engagement, and efficacy. And let me show you how this sort of works in real life. So let's take, um, uh, we have, we've gotten uh, incredible support from MacArthur Foundation, uh, about $100 million, to focus on Syrian refugees in the Middle East over the last five years. And so with that, we built a program called Ahlan Simpson. Um, that's the media sort of content that we developed, and then with IRC, International Rescue Committee, have partnered to actually do direct service work in the Middle East for Syrian refugees. So with that, if I take reach, we know now, right, over the past uh, four or five years, we're now reaching 23 million um, children two to eight in the region through media content, and then a million through direct services, right? So we've got that reach. We know that they have access to our content. Um, they've engaged with it. Then now we look at it engagement. We know that in the region, we have 49% of two to eight-year-olds who are actually watching the program, which is huge, right? Um, and then 79% of those kids who are watching 
are watching daily, right? So again, that's incredible engagement, right? We know that not only you know, have they watched it once, but they are watching it consistently. That gives us like the dosage, right? If you're thinking about that from a, a deeper impact model. And then we look at efficacy. And we actually, again, this is something we've invested heavily in. We've invested about $30 million in actually making sure that, you know, what we're doing is moving the needle. So we've had two studies that came back recently. Literally, this is like hot off the press. Not even in the presses yet. That'll be next month. So you guys are getting a sneak peek. Uh, one, we were studying the mass media efficacy, right? We were looking in schools. Uh, well, we did the study in schools, although it was just looking at the media. And we were able to show that in 12 weeks of just viewing the media, there was no additional programming around it, we were able to significantly move the needle on children's emotional skills, right, on their ability to identify emotions, and to use simple strategies like, you know, uh, counting to five or belly breathing. So we know that the content we're developing is actually moving the needle. We were also then able to look at a specific context of Syrian refugees and show that we could create a remote program right during COVID where we could actually take this content, leverage teachers and parents in these refugee contexts, and move the needle on kids learning in 11 weeks. We were able to show that engaging with our content and using teachers and parents could move the needle equivalent to a year of preschool right, in person. So those are the kinds of things. So now we have the efficacy line. So that's the kind of way that in, in the long term we might take a program, in this case our Ahlan Simpson work, and be able to show that we've sort of met ourselves on all three. And I will tell you, if we can't meet all three of those, we got to go back to the model, right? we got to figure out, do we have the wrong partners? Are we not developing the right content? Each of those are a critical component, and if we don't reach one of those, we have to really go back and look at ourselves. Yep. Uh, Adding to what uh, you just said, I think uh, there are two aspects to it. One is quantifiably miserable, you know, aspects uh, as far as the accountability towards, you know, driving your mission is concerned. And the second is that ethically and culturally are you serving it, right? I'll share a couple of examples like, you know, we conduct a think tank monthly meeting with the leadership team and we every month we write do's and don'ts. Like what are a couple of things which ideally we should not have done, right? retrospect and see that, you know, does that, does that really make sense, the mission with, with which we sort of, you know, started all this and, you know, and, and then we course correct, right? You know, of course, as a human, you end up, uh, you know, making mistakes, right? But then if you are compounding in terms of, you know, doing the course correction, right, over, overall, you know that, you know, you are not deviating too much, right? That's one. Second is, there are certain matrices like employee NPS, customer NPS, and all those things, everybody uses it. But more importantly, you know, when you say that, you know, we want to provide high quality education around new age life skills, right? At every, so we have defined journeys and we have said that at every stage of the journey, is there, are there enough signals, are there enough, uh, you know, things to measure wherein we can attribute that, you know, the, the child has achieved or gained what we, what we were willing to, you know, impart as part of the education, right? So that is second. Number three, again is very important is like one experiment I, it, you can call, call it hack uh, we did was that you know all the senior folks in the company uh, we, we created a sort of image with the mission statement in it and we made sure that all the Zoom meetings, all the Google meeting, meeting we do, the background will be that image, right? It's sort of very strongly conveyed to everybody that you know this is what we live for, this is what we are, right? And then if you, if you innocently or knowingly do anything which slightly deviates, people will point out, see what is written in your background, right? So what I'm trying to say, accountability can come in various ways, right? You can create these interesting experiments, uh, and, uh, but then by and large, you have to have accountability in terms of measuring it properly, and also culturally aligning the whole, whole uh, you know, uh, employee, employee pool and, uh, you know, your shareholders, everybody is, uh, you know, in whatever way they are involved in the company to make sure that, you know, this is what we breathe in and breathe out, right? Yeah. I was just going to add one thing. I think both panels have excellently answered it. In terms of tracking impact, it's really important to look at what your objective is and ensure that the result um, links back to that objective. So I'm a big fan of OKRs um, in the management planning world. And one of the things they tell you is as you set your key result, um, make sure it's gonna impact that objective. So if I have an objective of, of getting in shape and my result is that you know, I, I'm gonna go to the, my commitment is I'm gonna go to the gym 
gym four times a week. Um, that may not impact that objective. I could go to the gym and sit on my phone in the locker room, which is much more enjoyable. Um, but if, so that doesn't actually do that. The right key result would be that I'm gonna get my you know, heart rate up to over 140 beats a minute four times a week. And so in tracking that, you know, it, I think you know, Sesame Street has a, a, a very clear outlined way of measuring everything and that should be the ideal. And certainly companies that have been around decades have the opportunity, but in the short term, making sure that what your mission says, that you're tracking results that link back to that and actually can prove that it's the efficacy that um, Allison was speaking to. And I think that's so important um, as you evolve to where a company after decades decades can get to, what in the short term can you put in place for your mission to show to your employees, to show to your investors, to show to your shareholders, um, whoever, you're, you're, the people that you serve, that you're actually having the impact that you set out to have, and to show to yourself. Um, so I think really thinking of those results and how they link back to that objective. Just maybe adding one last uh, point on that, I totally agree, you know, what you measure, that is what you optimize, right? So. At Quizzes, we are small enough that internally within our team, we operate with this idea of trust. So internally, you know, we believe that each individual employee would make that right decision. However, just to broadly see if we are moving as a company in the right direction or not, the two key things which we look at are, hey, how many teachers are actually coming in? They're using uh, uh, Quizzes because the best way to know if what you have built is working or not, your customers are, you know, coming and voting uh, with their feeds. So I think that sort of is like, you know, the key pillar which we look at. And then uh, just to add on what Alison was saying, like efficacy is such an important aspect there. So we do also look at like, hey, students, if you are motivating these students, are these students really excited to not only finish their assignment, but then continue redoing it until unless they achieve that mastery. So in our case, we see like 25% of the students kind of, you know, once they have reached a certain grade, but they are not happy with it, and we as a company have been successful in moving, you know, getting them motivated to not give up, continue trying again and again, and increase that grade level by two points. So I think those are like the two guardrails at least we at Quizzes look at. Thank you. Thank you all for really insightful sort of view on, on how exactly we break this down and measure it. Um, switching gears slightly in the last um, seven minutes of this conversation um, is I want to bring us back to the present and, and context, right? So together on this panel, I think we have a company age of 178, right, in total. Um, Right now in the US, um, context-wise, we're seeing a lot of censorship over reading specifically books. Texas has banned, I think, over 800 books. There's a specific targeting of race, racism, LGBTQ-related topics. In India, on the other hand, 2021 was saw over $4 billion go into the market around ed tech. 2022 has seen 2.6, maybe. Um, there's a lot of layoffs happening in this space. There's a lot of uncertainty um, around what was a really exciting, and I think is continues to be an exciting space. But what does the context in which all of us, all of you operate, and um, how does the context, rather, influence your mission? How does the geographic, political, and other sort of context in which you're building um, have an effect on, on your mission? And um, yeah, and, and of course, I'd be remit to mention as well, increasing concern about um, children's privacy, data, monitoring, surveillance, like all of these are topics that are existing um, around us. So how do you think about this in context with your mission? How are you responding to this? Um, and I'll, I'll put you, Kate, on the spot and then we can go. <laughs> sure, so the GoGuardian portfolio of products is quite broad. The company started with a solution to help IT administrators track and find Chromebooks. So as Chromebooks were coming into the um, classrooms and there were suddenly thousands of devices rolling around, um, the GoGuardian admin was just kind of a really useful way to provision, deploy, and protect those investments from school districts. So you know that was 2014 and um, the company 
started, though, with the mission of helping all students feel ready and inspired to solve the world's greatest challenges. Um, so they knew that that wasn't the end expression of what they wanted to build. And uh, they moved from there into classroom management tools, trying to help with the efficiency of uh, educators and improve classroom community and conversation. Um, from there, they saw a really significant need developing to help students um, and to help schools protect students from self-harm and suicide threats and violence, which if you want to talk about context and controversy um, and really big uh, questions around you know, what is our responsibility as educators or our responsibility as parents? What kind of protections do we want to put around students who might be at need versus an individual student's right to privacy? Um, so these are major conversations that we are having, and we have an incredible team inside our company who, um, you know, they are at the forefront of thinking about all of those issues, and they start with the lens of mission, right? They start with the lens of, what is it that we are trying to do? What is it that we've built? And how do we need to be responsive and thoughtful to not just the changing political conversation, not just to um, you know, what might be challenges that are arising just from uh, new technologies that are emerging and the need to regulate them responsibly, but really fundamentally from the perspective of the mission how are we living that? What are our own ethical responsibilities to ourselves? What kind of world are we trying to build? And how do we do that together? Um, so that's part of the GoGuardian portfolio. And there's this other part of the portfolio that's about learning tools. And it's about the joy and wonder of engagement. And there's a real tension, I think, between those two things that the political context that we're in right now, in particular, can very much make feel at odds. Um, it can very much feel like, okay, well, you know, we've got these serious tools over here, and then you've got like the fun learning tools. But the fun learning tools need to be looked at with just that same lens of responsibility, just that same lens of efficacy, measuring the impact. I think one of the things that we talk about internally a lot is that we have to earn a place in every school. Right? There is such a limit on the amount of dollars that schools have to invest in solutions that it is absolutely critical that what we build, how we build it, the roots that it has in real learning research, that we're doing it responsibly. And uh, if we do that, and we do that well, we actually believe revenue is the outcome, right? It's, it's the critical elements of how we're building and how we're thoughtfully putting this together and how we do that through the mission, you know, through the lens of the mission that is really, I think, most critical. And so what we want to do is, you know, be able to communicate that through our brand building. So whether it's, you know, our, our event presence, it's our, you know, marketing messaging, you know, we are always working very closely with privacy, legal, education, research to do that as responsibly as possible. But I'd love to hear more about how you do it too, because I'm like, this is the, the a master class from all down the line. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so I just think quickly, because I know we don't have much time. I think two things for us uh, popped to mind. One is we don't have a choice at Sesame about being part of context. Um, if you are on Twitter, I mean, Muppets get called out for stuff all the time, right? So like, we have to respond. That said, we've been pretty proactive, right, since day one. I mean, I think we think of our, we think about our theories of change, right, as a nonprofit and as, a, as an impact organization, we think about our theories of change and we think about multiple levels, children, parents, providers, and then systems and culture. That is actually part of our theory of change. We know that if we put, you know, let's take emotional well-being, if we say mental health is important for young children, we can change the conversation. So we take that on ourselves to change the context. That puts us in a firestorm, um, but we've also said it's our power. We need to be able to step into that to a certain extent. We did the same thing after the murder of George Floyd. We said racial justice is something. Parents need to understand how to talk to their kids. There are children and families who are in crisis, who don't feel safe going out of their home. We need to be able to address that. So we put ourselves in that space, but we also know that we get that trust back because people know that we're going to deal with tough topics, which is what kids and families are dealing with right now. Yep. I, I, I'll just add a couple of points. Uh, I think being in the education sector, right, we need to attain a higher moral order, uh, you know. Uh, there's a difference between being legally right and ethically right, right? So 
aligning with the compliances, regulations, all those are fine. You know, that's a necessary thing you have to do. But then, given that you know you are in education field, you need to attain a higher order of you know standard for yourself. That's one. Second is the political context and you know the local local context which you mentioned. You know, we, we are present in so many countries. Recently, India introduced national education policy wherein they are saying that, you know, technology education, financial literacy are very important. They are formally introducing it. US has a lot of, you know, traction on that, right? There are many other countries wherein the traction is not so much because the political willpower is still not that strong around these new age skills, right? So you need to adjust your, you know, execution and, you know, you need to articulate your strategy accordingly. But then it is very important that you know, when you are teaching to a child in a given country, even though you have a global context, you marry that context with the local context. The kind of celebrations, the kind of festivals they are enjoying, the kind of things they are doing in their society, if you are not aligning the local context with the global miss mission, then you can be a less engaging product, right? So I think three key things, at any higher order of morality, being in education, second is that, you know, understand what uh, politically and you know contextually what is going on where and align the things accordingly and third is just try to understand that you know culturally who they are and how do you serve them beautifully yeah well i think i could have this conversation for another 40 minutes but there's a, a lot to follow look we've talked about product we've talked about team we've talked about accountability We've talked about um, the importance of context, and there's lots more to talk about. So I think if folks have questions um, and would like to tap into this incredible group of people here, I would encourage um, us to meet outside the room, as I know that there's um, other uh, f folks coming in. Um, but continue to have the conversation, and thank you all for, for joining today and um, uh, you know entertaining some of my trickier questions. And I, I held some quotes back from podcasts from many years ago. Uh, but thank you all, and, and most especially, thank you to our esteemed panelists. Uh, enjoy the conference, folks. Thank you, Apollo. Thank you. Thank you very much.